And so here we are, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends. It's Friday evening, and for whatever reason you're not out having fun, you're inside listening to me. <laughs> well, I hope I can make a nice evening for you anyway. And what a story I have for you. Hope you're ready for a long one. You're going to be with me for about 45 minutes this evening. Listening to another experiment story, my favourite. So, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear, dear friends, because it's time to listen. I didn't look at the hours for this place. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to make the introductions brief but I think it's going to get dark out soon. The night managers kicked me out before for not following the two-hour-per-day rule, respective of their goddamn computers. I just started, but I know this is going to take a while to explain in full detail. My name is Frederick Thomas Atano. I'm known, however, around this town as Tom, at least to my friends, or my ex-friends. Fuck me, I don't even know anymore. I'm 19 years old. I'm a graduate of Milton High School in the town of Milton, Georgia. The reason I'm telling you this is because they're undoubtedly going to find my body somewhere far away from this cursed place. I can't die here. Not in this fucking town. <laughs> Speaking of my body, it'll have black, medium-length hair and hazel eyes. But I'm sure those will have rotted away by the time someone finds me. I'm about six foot even, and have a scar running up my right side from when I had my appendix removed. <laughs> I really hope that's enough information for them to tell. I need to start from the beginning. My parents kicked me out of the house exactly three months after I graduated high school. At the time, I hadn't done anything wrong. In fact, I should have prepared myself more adeptly, because I knew it would come. They told me as I'd been growing up that every man in the Etano family had left when he was 18 years old. And there's some bullshit fuck tradition. Oh, coincidence as I like to say. Everyone in remembered history had become incredibly successful through finding some kind of lucrative career. My great-great-grandfather had been a plantationer. Yes, I am a descendant of white supremacists. Hey, don't judge me. My great-grandfather had started a relatively successful tannery, but it ran out of business before he died. Yeah, what with all the machines usurping the Luddites. <laughs> My grandfather had become a lawyer, ironically, who took jobs defending black citizens in civil cases. Good career, considering no other white male lawyer would take that kind of job in those times. My father, who is currently a nurse of Milton General, wanted me to follow in his footsteps and go through medical school. He said that if I started college right after high school, he would have paid for tuition and board wherever I went. Huh. Great little family, if you're looking from the outside. Yes, I am incredibly pissed off with my parents, so mired in superstition and tradition did the same thing to me in this modern day and age. Two thousand and goddamn nine. I don't have a car, but as far as I know, they're still at least paying for my health insurance. Dad gave me a thousand dollars when I'd left. Said, if I was wise, I'd return home with a hundred times that amount. Well, apartments around here are an arm and a leg. I could spend a week in one with that money, <laughs> Motels were better, but were still ephemeral in their housing capabilities. I figured I could spend a month or so in one before I ran out of money, let alone the cost of food, clothing, and weed. Don't get me wrong, I wanted a job, bad. But this was right after the economy crash in 2008. No place would hire me. The only places that would take me would have to wait another two years, since so many involved selling alcohol, 
shop clerks and the like. As angry as I am at them forcing me into this, I do miss my parents. So, I had to be resourceful. No one was buying houses around this time, and a big old plantation house had just gone out of business. The owners only having left a few weeks before. No one had bothered to lock the front gates, or even the front doors for that matter. It was perfect. The house was huge, three stories tall. It was like you would expect a mansion to be. White marble pillars, winding staircases, and a surprising amount of paintings and furniture left behind. At first I'd been afraid the owners would come back to retrieve the rest of the shit they'd left lying around. But three days had passed after I began my squatting in the old place, and no one ever came back. <laughs> I was a little lucky, at last. Although I have to shower at the local YMCA, and there's no electricity, so nights really suck. I have to rely on candlelight most of the time, and walk down to the gas station down the road every time I wanted to take a dump in a working toilet. But I got along. Anyways, thank God I'd been popular in school. I'd kept in touch with four friends in particular. Matt, Tyler, Amy, and Brooke. They visited me regularly, at least once a week, showing the same level of ambivalence when it came to trespassing that I did, thankfully. We actually had a lot of good times together. They'd always bring me care packages of food and water, not to mention plenty of crime. We'd always get high and play board games at night, or tell ghost stories. Sometimes they even spent the night with me. Exploring that house in the dark was spooky, and they always made sure to bring flashlights. I still don't think we found everything that place was hiding. <laughs> when I write that sentence now, I am thankful. <laughs> but you're probably wondering why I'm giving you my life story. I'm sorry if I've been boring you, but I need you to know that the decisions I've made, the decisions I had to make, I had no choice. I need you to understand there was no choice in what I did to myself, what they did to me. I just need someone, anyone, to get this to the right people. Make those fuckers pay for this hell they've unleashed on not just me, but others too. I'm positive. Living in a house with no electricity was more than boring. It was dull to the point where I thought clawing my own skin off could only alleviate the boredom. So, I'd taken on two different hobbies. Reading the editorials in the local newspaper and renting books from the library. I was so glad library cards are free. Even vagrants like me could be treated like every other breadwinner in the city. My friends had been over. Amy and Brooke had gone out to dinner for all of us, leaving us three guys behind. Matt was high as a kite. Tyler reaching for his levers, he took another thick hit from the same bong they always brought. He passed it to me, but I put my hand up fascinated by what I was reading in today's newspaper. I was under the job listing section, perusing the various ad that I mostly skimmed over. A habit I felt only those afflicted by dementia and chronic disease of toothlessness would have fully developed. <laughs> yes, I never believed I would read a newspaper in my life. Hell, <laughs> I was practically a senior citizen at this rate. The ad that caught my attention explained that there was a new drug a pharmaceutical company called IDS Corp had created. It listed the company as a host of trial testing they were performing through psychiatric wards all across the states. Although the advertisement itself was terse in its elaboration of the whole experiment, what really caught my eyes rested at the bottom in surprisingly modest print. All participants would receive $1,000 upon successful completion of a two-week trial period. Anyone interested in the trial could inquire further at any hospital psychiatric ward, clinic, or psychiatry office. I love my friends. I knew they would stay by my side for a long while, 
but I also knew that that wouldn't last forever. Amy was transferring to BSU in Colorado next year. Matt would be moving to California soon. Tyler was joining the military. And Brooke, well, I only knew Brooke through Amy. Once she left for Colorado, I doubt Brooke would stick around me for much longer. You know how it works. A thousand dollars in my reserve of almost depleted money would make all the difference in tidying myself over until I could find a job opening locally. And this, yeah, this sounded like free money to me. I tapped Tyler on the shoulder as he'd sunk into the couch, grinning widely like he'd just seen his first pair of tits. I asked him if he could drive me to the head shrinker I used to go to when I was younger. In his stupor, he easily agreed, saying he'd take me tomorrow. I grinned, knowing even if he did regret making the promise in a few hours when his high wore off, he'd do it anyway. He never went back on his word. Tyler was hard-headed like that. He'd taken me to the place, which was on the other side of town. I was glad my old doctor wasn't there anymore. Ah, Don't get me wrong, I'd loved her. But she told me it had been one of the happiest days of her life when I had decided to get off the shit she was prescribing me. It would have broken her heart to have seen me back in that office. Tyler told me he'd come back from me in an hour, said he had errands to run. So I went in, telling the receptionist at the front why I had come. God damn it. If I had listened to my gut at that moment, followed my instincts then, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here writing this out. The face she made when I told her about the ad I'd seen. If I'd just insisted to myself that the shadow of a frown that crossed that pretty young lady's face for a fraction of a second. (sighs) Of course, her job was to entice people further into the bowels of the place, not drive them away. She smiled and told me I wouldn't need an appointment that they had a special doctor on standby just for people like me. I hadn't expected this, but figured it was for the best. Less trips for Tyler and all that. After spending a few minutes in that same old waiting room, of which I swear the magazines had not been updated since I was a child, they called me back. Most people would censor the names of the individuals they encounter in memoirs for privacy purposes. Well, frankly, I don't give a shit about that at this point. The doctor's just as guilty as all the rest of them as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Alex Keane. And I hope to God that's his real name, not just the one written on his name tag. He was a relatively young man, looking to be in his mid-thirties. He had a thick dark beard and a head shaved due to his premature bald. He told me he was glad I'd been with them before, unlike other applicants for the tests who had come recently before me. It made things far simpler, since my record already existed. A snapshot of all the things wrong with my brain. This was about the point I asked him what this was all about, my curiosity overwhelming him. He chuckled and closed the door to his office, beginning a methodical explanation of the drug like he had memorized it by heart. The drug was an antipsychotic called Novus. Told me the only applicants they would accept for the trials needed to meet certain criteria. These qualifications included a past history of either negative or positive symptoms of schizophrenia, documented by at least one medical professional. I had negative schizophrenia. Yes, I know what you're thinking. (laughs) This guy has schizophrenia. The whole story is just crazy to me. Well, yeah, believe me, I've heard it all. But if you're not ignorant as to each variation of the disorder, you'd know positive symptoms are the ones always shown in movies, where people see crazy shit, hallucinated their spouse into some monster, and murdered them in self-defense. The ones that hear voices telling them to do bad things. Psychosis. Well, no. 
That isn't what I had. The far more understated side of the disorder, the negative symptoms, included flat expressions or little emotion, poverty of speech, inability to experience pleasure, lack of desire to form relationships and lack of motivation. I didn't have all of these, but I had enough to merit worry in my parental units. They thought it had been depression, but my first doctor, the nice one I told you about, found otherwise. She prescribed me aripiprazole, or Abilify, for those of you who aren't pharmaceutically savvy, another commonly used antipsychotic slash antidepressant. Keem asked me if I still felt these symptoms, however insignificant they may be. I lied, saying I still did. But hey, I needed the money. I was desperate, like I said. And that was it. No mental screening. No convoluted psychiatric evaluation. Just the question. Are you still experiencing these symptoms? Well, I knew there had to be a catch. A bigger one than just a history of mental deviations. So I grilled this guy for information. And he delivered. Hesitation kept to a minimal, surprisingly. He explained to me that standard antipsychotics worked as antagonists against certain receptors in the brain. This, inevitably, led to heavily pronounced side effects, surpassed only by anti-anxiety meds. The whole gimmick of Novus was that it would be the first drug for schizophrenia sufferers that had little to no side effects. How can this be possible, you may ask? Novus displayed linear pharmacokinetics that were completely hyperactive in comparison to any other existing medication. Its elimination half-life was approximately 11 hours, seven times faster than Abilify. Its maximum plasma concentration, or peak functional capacity, was only reached after about two hours after oral dosage, compared to three or five in Abilify. The drug was a much more potent nervous system depressant, however. So, how does this all fit together? My instructions were to take it once every day, one hour before bedtime. The hopes of IDS Corporation was that the depressants would act similar to sleep aids, such as diphenhydramine, although on a far more effective level. Then, as the patient slept, the drug would release and work whilst the test subject was unconscious, keeping exposure to side effects to a minimum. Considering the medicine supposedly wore off by the time the patient was expected to awaken from rest. Novus did not negatively alter the waking lives of those who took it. It couldn't. It only acted during nocturnal hours, or whenever the patient chose to sleep. IDS Corp was so confident in this idea that their drug wouldn't induce side effects. They had staged this public stunt, rather than running their new wonder medicine through R&D like every other self-respecting company. I asked them then how they would know if people actually took the drug, considering we wouldn't be monitored at all, save for a brief visit in the center of the two-week trial period. He told me there was a certain ingredient in Novus, similar to fluoride in how it built up in the body after continuous exposure, rather than a maintained threshold like other elements. He further explained how, at the end of the trial, a simple blood test would be performed to evaluate how much of this mystery ingredient was in me. If the expected amount after 14 pills was present, IDS Corp would hand over the check. If it wasn't, the doctor would have to assume the patient hadn't taken the pills every day, and wouldn't be authorized to pay the test subject. I wanted to know more about this ingredient, and if there would be any ill effects that came of its temporary build-up in my body. But he had already gone to retrieve the familiar foil packet lines with small red bumps, each one containing a 5 milligram dose of Novus. He asked if I had any other questions, as though he hadn't heard my latest one. I tell you, Less than a second passed before he smiled and nodded, escorting me to the door and wishing me well. 
reminding me that I needed to check in in exactly one week. At the time, I didn't see it. But now, I know. I was asking too many questions, and the doctor knew it. Keem had to get rid of me before I'd gotten too curious. The receptionist handed me a card listing the time and day they expected me next. Tyler was waiting for me as I entered the waiting room, perusing a car magazine. He asked me if what I held was the new drug. I affirmed this as we walked out, and he drove me back to my makeshift house. Mm, okay, the first week. It was actually far better than I'd expected. I had lied, said I had negative symptoms still dwindling in my system, even though I didn't. So I can't speak for that side of things. But I was knocked out after every dose, of which I took right before I hit the sack, just like they told me to. No restless sleep, just a solid 10 to 11 hours of uninterrupted, dreamless sleep. As much as I hated to admit it, there weren't any side effects. No fogginess or drowsiness the next day. No akathisia, like I'd experienced with Abilify. No increased suicidal thoughts or depression. Those first seven days had been some of the most blissful of my life. I honestly couldn't believe that they were paying me to take Novus with how well it worked. At least when it came to the sleeping portion. And then, on day eight, Tyler took me to the office again. I saw Keem and told him how well things were going. He smiled and told me that was great, and he looked forward to my final return in another week. I did too. The visit was brief, and I was feeling good about it. My friends were spending the night since it was Friday evening, so I was looking forward to that night. But this is when things started to change. When Tyler drove me home that twilight. It was minuscule, something I'm sure anyone could have been tricked by. So I shrugged off what I thought I'd seen as we drove. As we drove through the neighborhood my plantation squat resided in, the orange glow of the setting sun was casting reflections on all the windows of the houses as we drove past. The cars parked in people's driveways, too. I'd seen a glint of orange. Not robust enough in its shine to have been from the sun. This was coupled with a round, dark silhouette in the corner of my eye. It was a person, walking down the sidewalk, smoking a cigarette. I turned to see if I recognized him and nearly exclaimed when I'd seen what we had driven past. It had, in fact, been the reflection of a streetlight off the back of a Durango, the rounded convex window created with a circular, dark shadow, just beneath the more yellowish-coloured shine. <sighs> there had been no one there. As Tyler drove, I had to try to shake it off, but found it difficult. There was something about what I thought I'd seen. Just how succinctly my mind had painted such a clear picture of something that didn't exist. Just from a flash in the periphery of my vision. This wasn't just a lapse in visual judgment. My mind had actually convinced itself that that was the only thing it could have been. A person smoking. Ignoring the fact it could have been a hundred different things we'd driven past. I didn't tell Tyler. Obviously. What was I supposed to say? Besides, I was sure it was nothing. <laughs> a brain fart. Nothing more. We all had them at some point. We returned to the old house. Greeted by a living room that was already hanging heavy with a strong smell of Mary Jane. Amy, Matt and Brooke were already pretty far gone. Tyler and I joined in. I had quickly forgotten about the whole hallucination incident, if I could even call it that. The munchies came. We ate dinner, and then some, as the high gradually wore off. 
I can't remember whose suggestion it was. I honestly don't know why I agreed to it to begin with, even if I was in a more naive state. It was, regardless of anything, not a good idea. Hide and go seek. We had enough flashlights for every person. The house was huge, and we were all still energized from the sativa. The agreement had been unanimous. It became a little fuzzy from that point forward, at least for the next hour or so. We'd played a few games and thoroughly enjoyed it. I do, however, distinctly remember when my turn came to be the seeker. I'd counted to a hundred, as the other four all found places to seclude themselves within an easy feat in the old mansion, even with rules in place forbidding finding any hiding spots outside of the plantation house. On my own, without the joyous, inebriated banter my friends and I shared together, I began noticing things about the house I hadn't seemed to care of before. The sun was long dead at this point, the moon casting in shadows of the corpses of trees from the outside along with the depressed, drooping branches of weeping willows. My steps were light over the decaying carpet of the living room as I made my way into the central atrium, a single, winding staircase leading upwards to the second and then the third story. Only the moon and my flashlight provided the means to vision not completely consumed by the prolific darkness the house seemed to provide a superfluity of. I decided to start from the third story and work my way down. This was an unusual choice in retrospect, considering I tended to avoid the top floor. It was some symptom derived from obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm sure, but I hated being high up in any building. It stemmed from irrational fears of earthquakes. <laughs> How fucked I would be so far from the doors out of the place. No matter. That was the old, neurotic me. The current me knew how small these chances were. When I reached the top floor, I immediately heard footsteps. Faint, quick, and then gone. I didn't hear them again. The highest floor stemmed into four perpendicular hallways. Down every one, I saw nothing but the silvery glow of moonlight. As I looked down each one, I made the conscious decision to pursue one of the two directions I had never explored, knowing my friends would likely have taken these routes to finding their hiding places. Down the left hallway, I realized there was an old, dusty portrait hanging above the grandfather clock, still monotonously swinging its singular pendulum back and forth. I remembered this was where the term like clockwork could come from, as I absently shone my beam of light over the portrait, gleaming the features it had to offer. A woman in a white Victorian era dress, her regal profile faced sideways to the painter's perspective, her nose button and pretty. But there was something that immediately sent chills down my spine as I laid my gaze upon it. The woman, I realized, was bald. I shut my eyes, clearing my vision, looking back to the portrait. No, she had hair, black tendrils, silky even through the canvas, poured over her forehead. What the f... I was perplexed by how I could have ignored such a pertinent feature. I did a double take, making sure it wasn't just a shadow. No. It was hair. How could a pale colour like skin be mistaken in such a dark environment? How did I see white skin instead of black hair? I took a step back, slightly creeped out. I turned away, trying to erase the thought I'd seen skin from my head. Instead, I focused my attention on where the footsteps had come from. This was a vain effort. Sound reverberated oddly in that house. I continued wandering down this singular hallway that seemed to go on forever. 
until it finally teed off into two directions at its end. I decided to go right. I was immediately greeted by an open door. Contrary to seemingly every other one in the panoply the house contained. This had to be a lead. One of my friends had to be in there. The darkness seemed palpable in a tiny old bedroom. I scanned over the bed and dresser on one side nearly jumping when I heard a barely audible squeak behind me. A closet door slightly open. Hadn't it been shut when I headed inside? I peeked inside, asking all my friends' names. I saw nothing but an empty wooden space inside. A single, dusty coat rack spanning along the sparse length of its interior. It was at this point I began to feel. Afraid. The darkness seemed to breathe, threatening to consume me the moment my flashlight's batteries would run out. Something I found myself praying against. The door must have been open. The noise? Just the house settling. I tried calming myself as I exited the unpleasantly claustrophobic room. This only worked to an extent. My throat was tight, my flesh crawling as I slammed the door behind me. The dread was not leaving. I thought I heard shallow breathing behind the door, a noise that immediately grew distant as I exited that room's proximity. I don't know what happened, even in retrospect, but the fear swelled into a vortex of unmitigated primal terror. I was indubitably sure that there was something in that room. Something that hid from me like my friends were. My mind uncontrollably raced, piecing together the most vile abominations only twisted minds behind the horror genre could conjure up. Talons clicking on the rotting wooden floor. A long, wet tongue. Yellowed fingernails, hardened and twitching in murderous anticipation. I had this intense delusion that this, this thing wanted to eat me, to consume every part of my body, its skeletal face contorting at the thought of sucking down my pooling blood. I told myself to calm down as I made distance between the room. I took deep breaths, constantly pausing my own footsteps to listen to the silence of the old mansion, rationalizing the ideas of something irrational lurking in the shadows. My friends were close, I told myself, but other than them, there was no one else here. The house looked big on the outside, but as I wandered the halls, oh, it was impossibly large. I was actually lost. It was like a nightmare, not a single whisper of another living being. I turned a corner, seeing yet another long hallway, the same closed door beneath every frame, the same peeling paint adorning every wall, the same empty wall sconces every other doorway. I had begun hyperventilating, my heart racing faster and faster. The house felt supernatural, like time vanished inside. I felt like I'd been wandering for hours. Just the same damn floor, mind you, let alone the two below me. I heard the same faint, quick footsteps again, now in the hallway I'd just turned from. My eyes had widened, my heartbeat sounding like a machine gun. I wanted to turn back and see which of my friends it had been. That was the small, rational part of me speaking, <laughs> the much larger Irrational voice in my head whispered for me to run, telling me it was what I'd heard in that tiny bedroom. The thing wanted to eat me. I was being watched. I was being fantasized about. My flesh a well of lust for some impossible being. It wondered how it should have separated my body. What part it wanted to eat first. The tanginess of the gristle, 
the satisfying chewiness of the muscle, the sweet slurp of the bone marrow. My panic was incendiary at this point. I was literally frozen in fear, not humanly understanding how to react to the confrontation I was planning to receive any second as I started at the corner I had turned, just twenty feet behind me. I finally mustered the courage to peek around the corner, pointing my flashlight to a doorway that was wide open. I caught a glimpse of white fabric, perhaps pale flesh beneath. The door slammed shut. I felt the blood drain from my face after I'd witnessed this. A cry caught in my throat. A deluge of fresh fear swept over me, a fear I'd never experienced before. I wanted to run, but I distinctly remembered avoiding that. Born of the trepidation, the apparition would chase me at impossible speeds if I dared turn my back upon. Standard practicum for vagrants, gypsies, and nomads was to carry weapons of some form in their travels, as to evade those with pernicious intentions. Though I had settled down, I was no different. I had remembered the pocket knife I kept holstered on my belt. With my off hand, the one not carrying the flashlight, I pulled it out and drew the crooked, serrated blade. The glint was congruent with the silver moonlight that spilled in through the windows. Fight or flight kicked in at this point. Whatever was stalking me, ducking room to room to evade my sight, I couldn't run from it anymore. In these moments, I knew it would pursue me if I ran, the way a cheetah would a gazelle. It wasn't one of my friends. I had called their names multiple times and no one had answered. None of them were in white. No. Whatever was in that room had egregious intentions for me. I began to tiptoe towards the closed room, knife in hand, positioned for a quick shank. With every anachronistic feature that passed me by, my concern grew. My brain wasn't ready to see what was behind that door, but my feet continued anyway. When I reached it, I heard the breathing again behind the rotting wood. Shallow, muffled, inhuman. I would make as much noise as possible, screaming and the like, so if I died fighting it, my friends would at least know to run or find me. I almost kicked the door down, and it swung loudly against its wall banging harshly and chipping out some dry wall. I shot my light beam through and through as quickly as possible, realizing this was another damned bedroom. Its design was almost identical to the previous one, but it was larger, and there was no bed here. In fact, the entire room was empty, which left only one option for my search. The closet. With much hesitation, I approached the door and gripped the brass knob. It was freezing cold, showing no signs of any human recently using it. Internally, I counted to three and proceeded to yank the door open. Inside, there was a... God, it was a thing... It hung from the coat hanger that ran the span of the closet by its hands. It had to, because beneath there was nothing but a torso, like the legs had been cut off at the hips. White tatters shrouded it, because clothes would not fit right on this thing. What the cloth didn't cover, I could only glean emptiness beneath. Not black, not white, but a simple lack of colour that I couldn't think of even today without my stomach turning. This space was not empty, as the vacuum beyond our planet is, but rather it was less than empty. It sucked in. It was hungry. 
It was the opposite of material. Human, maybe once. Dark hair spilled over its face, but when it looked up at me, I was instantly petrified. Oh, I'm sorry, but I will never put to word, either spoken or written, what its face looked like. For lack of a better explanation, it was simply all that a face should not be. And since this was happening, there has been no sight so horrible, so fearsome, so terrifying that has impressed itself upon me in the least. For how could it compare to this? I didn't think. I felt my eyes squeeze shut, and I felt my body lunge forward in its wretched realm, knife wielded as its scream coalesced with mine. I felt the metal plunge into its being, tearing away at what I wouldn't call flesh. No, flesh would be a misnomer. I remember after the first stab, I tore the knife to the right across its torso. I screamed and swore, and its horrific deluge of screeches inevitably continued. As some kind of defense mechanism, my eyes stayed shut on their own when I pulled away from the closet screaming down the hallway for my friends. I thought I heard scrapes and bangs behind me, like the abhorrent creature was wounded, and yanking upon the sconces to forward itself towards my position. When I finally reached the central atrium, I saw Tyler leading the charge up the stairs, followed by Amy. I heard Matt's yells coming from the first floor, asking what was happening. When I looked down, I saw him standing at the base of the stairs, looking afraid. I heard footsteps from seemingly all directions, Brooks echoing steps bouncing up from the second or first floor. I threw myself into Tyler's arms, already starting to weep. He had wide eyes, as did Amy. Beneath, I heard Matt and Brooke coming up. My throat clenched as I choked out what had happened pointing in the direction I'd come in, complete hysteria. Tyler kept looking at me in shock, but snapped out of it and ran to the room I had instructed them I had killed the monster in. I heard him scream shortly after, a loud swear. Amy rushed towards the room, now. I chased, not wanting to be alone, even in the short time it would take Matt and Brooks to meet up with me. I entered the room completely lit with LED lights, and saw Matt sitting in the corner, a hand over his mouth and his eyes like dinner plates, as he stared into the closet. Amy seemed dumbfounded, frozen on the spot just in front of the open door. Little as I wanted to see the thing again, curiosity of what its felled corpse looked like overwhelmed me. Just as I heard more footsteps approach the main door behind me, and Matt's frantic voice asking us what had happened, I felt my jaw drop. The entire inside of the closet was colored red, like someone had thrown a bucket of paint haphazardly into the tiny room. My eyes followed the dripping down to the source, which now pulled the ubiquitous fluid profusely on the hardwood floor. Broke! I spun around, seeing Matt's worried expression, but no one was behind him. I've thought back to that moment so many times, and it still haunts me that I thought, in my psychotic state, the echoes of the footsteps from the friends I saw fooled me into thinking there were more than just three pairs. The truth hit me like a wrecking ball when I looked back to her corpse. Her eyes were still big, the pretty blues in the center dully reflecting our flashlights. Her mouth was a game, tongue hanging out in a cartoonish manner that makes me sick at the very thought, let alone sight. In my fugue state, I hadn't just stabbed her. I had mutilated her. Rook's belly spilled intestines outwards, like 
enormous beige noodles with a red wine dressing spilling through them. Her shirt had been almost completely torn away, and her desecrated breasts hung freely out, coding deep cuts that spilled yellowish, corny substance outwards. On top of all this, her neck was pierced through. Not slit, pierced through. The trachea, the spine, and all the meat in between had been severed. I knew this because I witnessed the exit wound at the base of her neck, almost matching the entrance wound in size. Her head held onto the rest of her body only by the tendrils of skin on the left and right sides. I remember reading about how difficult such a move would be in some medical slash forensic textbooks my dad had been studying before he had become a registered nurse, that it would require immense strength with any weapon smaller than a machete. Amy had started crying. Tyler sat in the corner, running a hand over his head. Matt was just now seeing what I had done. Needless to say, I got the fuck out of there. Out of the room. Out of the house. Out of the entire area. Last night, I slept beneath a park bench on the grass. I'm sure by now they're looking for me. After I finish this document, I'm going to print it. Hopefully whoever sees this will see my name at the very top and realize just what it is. But I'll have to save it to this particular computer, just in case. You have to understand why I'm writing this. Novus, that wretched shit made me hallucinate, made my negative schizophrenia into positive schizophrenia times ten. I'm writing this because I get physically sick when I think back to my... I'm writing this because I get physically sick when I think back to that sight. My poor friend butchered because of me. Because of this fucking drug. If you're reading this, find Keem. Take it to the police, to court. Make IDS pay for what they've done. They shouldn't have tested it on the public. In an uncontrolled environment. <laughs> the arrogant fucks. This is my only hope of retribution. Even if I already know this won't prevent the abdication of my responsibility by the authorities. <sighs> At least it's a chance. Please. Take the time. Do something. Anything with my story. The truth must be known, and my two hours is up. Tell my parents I love them, and my friends that I am truly, truly sorry for what I've done. And hit print. May God have mercy on my soul. Did you like that one? Pretty good, I thought. That was another one from Dr. Creepin's Vault. Yep, that's right. This story was shared with me so that I could read it for all of you. Tell me you enjoyed it, please. <laughs> anyway, any thoughts, any feedback, any ideas about the story, please leave them in the comment section. You know I love to reply, as and when I can. Well, it's Friday. Get yourselves out and do something more fun than listening to me, eh? If not, 
and sweet dreams, and I'll be back on Monday. For now, bye-bye.